Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle DeMarzo, the museum's curator of education and academic engagement. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to another one of our quick live events. This one presented in conjunction with the exhibition uh, Lala Asadi by Design, Theater and Fashion in the Photography of Lala Asadi. And our guest this evening is one of Fairfield's very own professors, Dr. Sylvia Marson Sackley. Before we continue, I want to offer a brief content warning that there will be a disturbing image presented in the first few minutes of Dr. Marson Sackley's talk, so please uh, use caution. Sylvia Marson Sackley is an assistant professor of the Islamic world with a specialization in North Africa here at Fairfield. She received her BA in behavioral sciences from the University of Chicago. And after graduation, she joined the Peace Corps and served for three years in Tunisia, igniting a lifelong uh, passion for the people, cultures, and history of North Africa, the Middle East, and the Muslim world. She earned her master's from New York University in Near East Studies and Journalism and received her PhD in the Joint Program of Middle East and Islamic Studies and European History, also at NYU, where she worked on state colonialism, society relations, and social movements in Tunisia. She's published articles on Libya and on the 2011 Tunisian Revolution and is currently working on a book, uh, People, Power, and Protest in Tunisia, 1864 to 2011, for which she received a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. I'll remind everyone that if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to put them into the chat and I will present them to Dr. Marson Sackley after her presentation. Please join me in virtually welcoming Dr. Marson Sackley. Thank you so very much um, for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my reflections um, about uh, the La Saida's uh, remarkable um, photographic paintings, because that's what they are to me. Um, and I will be sharing with you some of my impressions and then um, taking you through a little bit of a history um, of, um, of two um, details of her work, which struck me very much. And that is um, the writing on the body um, and the bullets. Uh, used as ornamentation um, that you see here in this image. Um, and I will then draw some um, comparisons and um, discuss the, um, the personal status code um, using this writing uh, and law as metaphor um, for uh, uh, women's relation um, to the body politic um, in, in Morocco. So um, when I look at Lila Saidi's um, photographic paintings, I see women as part of interior spaces, enveloped in cloth, women reclining, stylized, ornamented. I look at the images and they are from a particular part of a woman's life cycle. Um, and that is the, the, the phase right before marriage, right? The prenuptial phase. Um, they are either alone or in concert with other women. Notably absent in the sexually segregated spaces is the male. All of these women are young, probably as evidenced by the henna at the threshold of marriage. Women with writing, which the author has said uh, was henna all over their bodies and faces, and not just the hands and feet as is traditional in, wed in North African weddings. Um, I can see that Lilla is reversing the gaze of Orientalist paintings and photographs typical of the colonial period that made women into the imagined site of foreigners' desire, primarily due to lack of access to these interior spaces. This set of images are in fact a, are a conversation with the history of colonial photography and colonial painting. The scenes and types genre of studio photography and postcard photography accessible through mainly prostituted individuals in colonial settings, as Malik Alula has um, amply demonstrated. Images of the harem and what people thought was happening in the harem um, are reproduced in these um, colonial postcards. So I'm going to focus on two aspects, um, like I said, the writing and the bullets. Um, and if we take the metaphorical power of the written word, um, we can see that this is also um, uh, 
an association with law in legal texts and by extension um, what we normally think of as a type of religious discourse um, embodied in religious um, religiously based law as Brinkley Messick has described in the case of Yemen in his book the calligraphic state quote textuality is a kind of capital fashioned by states jurists and politicians in this case it is the bodies of women and the henna is really interesting to me because the henna is temporary by nature. And so when we talk about these legal discourses, as I'm going to take you through the history, the, the, the claim is made that these discourses are unalterable, right? And that's part of their, um, of their power, right? Um, but in the henna, um, which can come off, I think um, Lila is suggesting that these, in fact, are um, are uh, temporary, and it's the women's agency that kind of comes out um, in these all of these images. Now, uh, I want to insert here a caveat here. Um, when I speak about these relationships and and the laws and the types of families that I'm going to describe and the powers um, or the lack of power um, in in women's um, agency here. Um, it's easy enough um, to reproduce a certain aspect of Orientalist discourse, which is, you know, that we can feel um, as Westerners that we have, in fact, gone over that um, that obstacle and have, in fact, have have achieved a higher level of liberation with regard to women's issues um, or a significant victory against the patriarchy. Um, and I want to. Um, caution us with that, um, that, you know, patriarchy is universal and um, we are at different points and not necessarily in a kind of an evolutionary relationship with this um, patriarchal power. Um, and I want to um, highlight, um, but also have an honest conversation about um, the real challenges uh, between cases and this tension between the body and the law with regard to the situation of women in Morocco. Okay, um, first I want to um, underscore a little bit about, um, you know, the bullets in Lila's paintings, and I'll call them photographic paintings. Um, they are, um, they appear as designs, um, but to me, um, given the history of colonialism in Morocco, uh, we don't really um, associate, um, you know, the violence of colonialism. Um, but here are two instances um, of the genre of colonial postcards. Um, and here Morocco was colonized from 1912 to 1956. Um, and if you look at the image over in the corner, um, so this is um, a postcard. It's a Casablanca street after French bombardment. And it is, um, that's exactly what it's titled, France in Morocco as a postcard, right? Um, and you see that the street is strewn with dead bodies. Um, so these were um, cards that travelers sent back and forth in this um, economy, this political economy of, of coloniality, right? Um, at the very top, you see here um, exemplary punishment in the Reef War, right? From 1921 to 1926, um, there was an uprising in the Reef region, which is um, right up here in Northern Morocco. Um, and um, rebels um, to, as an exemplary punishment, um, their heads were um, severed and placed on the tips of bayonets as a warning against um, uh, further rebellion. Um, so this to me, even though Lila's bullets are very stylized um, objects of beauty and organized into patterns, um, they have as a historian, and when I think of the colonial past, they have this very um, um, violent um, connotation. Um, and one of the things um, here in during the colonial period um, here, uh, the tradition of postcards um, 
this is, I think, the postcard tradition that Lila is directly in conversation with. Um, and you can see here, these were mostly prostituted um, individuals who posed in uh, studios um, and trade. And again, this was the kind of postcard traded um, by colonialism um, and colonial powers. Now, um, here, uh, sorry. Okay, um, we can identify here, um, you know, three critical periods um, of colonialism um, and, um, and the struggle over the women's um, body um, in the law. Uh, colonial powers did not touch the Islamic law um, that, that governed uh, personal status issues like inheritance. Um, they, um, they left that um, for local authorities. Um, uh, during colonization, uh, regions and local communities applied their own versions of Islamic law. Um, the French largely left the substance of family law untouched in part because they feared violent reactions to any alteration of established norms. Although women had more freedom in some regions than others, on the whole, um, rules and practices placed them under control of male relatives and husbands. There was no legal minimum age for marriage, which left room for child marriages. A woman did not give her consent to marriage during the uh, marriage ceremony. Consent to marriage was expressed by a matrimonial garden, guardian, typically the father, and it was his consent and not the bride's that made the marriage valid. Polygamy was legal. A man could in principle marry as many as four wives. Although rare were the men who had the financial resources necessary to support several wives and their children, the legality of polygamy was nevertheless a constant threat for women. Divorce was unequal between men and women. A man could terminate the marriage at will by repudiating his wife without court proceedings. A woman could obtain divorce by appealing to a religious judge and proving that she had been harmed in the marriage. As in other parts of the Islamic world, women had the right to own property and to continue to do so after marriage. Their individual property did not become part of the couple's common assets, which gave women means and a measure of security. Inheritance was unequal, however, in that the share of a woman was usually half that of a man in a similar situation. Now, um, during national, uh, during independence and national sovereignty, you had um, the promulgation of a national body of legislation. And in Morocco, this was the Mudawana, right? It was the family code um, proclaimed in 1957 to 1958. Morocco gains its independence in 1956. Um, Following national sovereignty in 1956, Morocco equipped itself with a national body legislation called the Mudawana, or Code of Personal Status, promulgated, implemented in um, 1957 to 1958. Defining the rights and responsibilities of men and women in the family, the Mudawana remained faithful to the Islamic legal tradition. And in fact, it was the, this appeal to unalterability of the text that gains it its legitimacy, right? The substance of the law was largely unchanged as repudiation and polygamy continued to be legal. There were two major differences, however. For the first time, Morocco had a family law that applied to the population as a whole. The regional differences that had existed previously were no longer recognized. This meant that some women now had less freedom and some more, but all Moroccan women were subject to the same law. The other difference with the colonial period was that the Mudawana presented in a concise and codified manner what had been previously a set of interpretations by legal scholars or a set of customs. Um, again, this kind of imper uh, customs that were um, that were continued and practiced 
but in a sense, we're not, it, it was the codification that gave them permanence. Um, Morocco now had a single unified text of law to which citizens and lawyers could refer. Now, uh, women's activism and changes in family law. Um, so there were several reforms here and the major reform was in 2004, um, but there were other, uh, it was due to um, uh, women's, uh, the pressure of women's associations and women's groups um, that you had um, alterations in the legal code. An important development in the 1980s and 1990s was the emergence of women's associations. Women's rights advocates became active in associations ranging from those with distinct feminist orientation to others tied to political parties to still others with a humanitarian bent. They used the channels of communication that the associations offered as a basis for demanding family law reforms. In part, as a result of women's activism, significant changes were brought to the Mudawana in 2004. The most remarkable forms of, um, the most remarkable reforms of 2004 concerned the age of marriage, divorce, and polygamy. Um, so marriage age changed from uh, a minimum of 15 to 18. Um, they they were, were given the, um, the right to divorce by mutual consent, um, thus giving women the right to divorce on the same grounds as men. They placed polygamy and unilateral repudiation by the husband under judicial control and restricted the conditions under which a judge would grant them, thus making them quite difficult for a man to obtain. They also eliminated the requirement of a matrimonial guardian for a woman to marry. Um, these reforms have been applauded by feminists in Morocco and elsewhere, but the issue now is to see how the reforms are implemented not only for the educated middle class, but also in rural areas among the less and among the less privileged urban groups. Um, this is a matter of women's that uh, in which women's rights advocates are concentrated. Um, okay. So now I'm going to talk to you about um, two cases. Um, and the first case is Amina Feleli. Um, and Amina Feleli, um, under Moroccan law, uh, rapists are, uh, rapists are, rape is punishable by five to 10 years in prison or between 10 to 20 years if the victim is a minor. Um, there is a loophole for the law and um, that is Article 47, uh, Law 475 states that when an adult corrupts a minor without the use of violence, threat, or fraud, the sentence is five years imprisonment, whether or not there has been sexual intercourse. Further, if the minor has married the adult, then the adult can only be tried if the minor's legal guardian presses charges and obtains an annulment. It was this loophole that uh, Amina's family used um, in order to marry off their daughter. Um, so Amina had uh, a 15 year old girl who had been uh, raped uh, or accused um, a rapist um, of having defiled her. Um, he was 10 years older than she was. And um, the family through this loophole forced Amina to marry her rapist. Um, she continued suffering abuse at the hands of the family, uh, of her adopted family, um, to the point of beatings and starvation. Um, and in the end, ended up um, ingesting rat poison and committing suicide at the age of 16. Um, this um, caused a furor um, and a lot of protests among um, uh, feminist activists. Um, this law, 75, which technically absolves a rapist of his crimes if he marries his victim, is not uh, only applicable in Morocco, but there are similar laws in Lebanon and Jordan. Um, and you can see here um, in this um, kind of uh, protest, right, uh, this uh, theatrical protest, uh, this is actually in Lebanon where women um, 
who have uh, who are either injured, as in their you know the the mock bandages with the um, blood stains, um, and uh, in their marriage costumes, um, are kind of offered up um, as a um, you know to to wipe the stain of um, of dishonor um, through marriage of the rapist. Um, Amina's mother. Uh, the court, the, the court uh, that decided to forcibly marry Amina to her rapist was supposed uh, to resolve the, the damage uh, of sexual violation against her, but it actually led to more suffering in the, in the unwelcoming home of her husband's family. Amina's mother um, told TV stations that her daughter had been mis mistreated and left to starve. Um, the Moroccan media ran with the story of Amina's forced marriage, um, and the idea of forced marriage is itself rooted in local rural traditions that safeguard the honor of the girls who are raped. Um, Article 475 pr uh, provides an opportunity for a perpetrator to actually avoid punishment and escape justice. Um, furthermore, it distinguishes between a, quote, plain rape and a quote, deflowering rape, and it does not recognize conjugal rape. Um, the new Moroccan constitution sets up uh, the principle of, equal of equality between men and women in all spheres compared with other countries in the um, Arab region. Morocco ranks high in political representation, but yet Moroccan women still fa face laws that are lenient toward husbands who harm their wives. Um, you have still um, unequal inheritances, and you have these um, loopholes in Law 475 and the human rights abuses. Um, here you can see the uproar um, that Amina's case uh, provoked um, in when women took to the streets. And this is not just um, unveiled uh, women, but also women um, from more conservative um, uh, backgrounds. Um, here, um, what's also at stake, um, so Ar Amina comes from that reef region, um, from which there was that, uh, rebellion that I alluded to in the, one of the first slides. Um, it's also, um, you have to factor in, um, poverty and rural poverty and rural norms, um, some tribal pressure. Um, so there's a real contrast, which is not necessarily exhibited in, um, in Lilla's paintings, right, or photographs. Um, here, what you have um, in this particular picture, you have um, to the left um, a kind of shanty town um, next to a tennis club. Um, so you have these real um, uh, contrasts between the ultra rich and the poor. Um, this is also one of the shanty towns um, in uh, near near Casablanca. Um, and you can see these little rocks here that are on top of the roof. These are corrugated roofs that can be blown very easily by the wind and the rocks um, kind of protect people um, in the homes. Um, rural uh, dwellers account for just 46% of Morocco's total population, but the rural poor account for 66% of all the country's people. Um, and women uh, from these particular classes um, work um, and, you know, are faced with um, abuse as, um, as maids. Um, okay. The other, the other case um, regarding the law and regarding um, the Mudawana, right, um, is Hejar Rasiuni. Um, Hejar Rasiuni uh, works uh, as a journalist um, or worked as a journalist and um, she was accused of engaging in premarital sex um, and of obtaining an abortion. She had uh, a posse of, um, of police uh, wait outside the clinic where she was, um, where she was going to be examined by a doctor um, and interrogate her. Um, the evidence was that she looked quote unquote, pale and tired after exiting a medical clinic. Um, she was submitted to um, an arrest 
later on and an invasive physical interrogation um, to determine whether in fact she had lost her virginity or had um, undergone um, the, the medical procedure of the abortion. Um, the interrogation lasted for hours um, and um, they also um, they uh, dragged her and her um, and her fiance, who was from, uh, he was a professor from the Sudan, um, to um, also to an interrogation. Um, the court sentenced her fiance and the doctor accused of the abortion to one and two years in prison, respectively. Um, all of them denied the the, the charges. Rasuni, her fiance, and the doctor were freed. Um, in, uh, were freed shortly thereafter after receiving a royal pardon. And so the image here that you see is actually of the king. Um, so the king uh, pardoned um, Heja Rasuni and um, her fiance, um, but did not clear them of the charges. Um, so um, the issue here is not necessary. So think about the invasiveness of um, in terms of the text and the law um, and the procedures that the law allows in terms of the invasion of the woman's body, right? Um, that uh, Lilla's uh, photographs suggest, um, and he's in here, you know, is a real case. Um, Hezer ended up um, moving to the Sudan um, and she is not alone in that. Um, there have been others, uh, other cases um, who have gone to other countries in order to avoid um, this kind of um, harassment by the state authorities in terms of what they've done with their bodies. Um, the issue with Hezer, though, is that um, she's a journalist. Um, and she is a journalist for Akhbar al um, over here, this particular newspaper. And this is one of the few independent newspapers that um, criticize or dare to criticize the monarchy um, and uh, write articles about corruption. Um, so there is this, um, this, this tendency to target independent journalists and critics of the regime um, with accusations of, of, of sex crimes. Um, this has also been um, documented with Amnesty International. If you look up Morocco and um, uh, uh, crimes uh, that have to do with sexuality, um, and it's not just women here. There are also men who have been accused of, uh, of rapes, um, unjustly accused, and, um, and also accused of raping other men. Uh, which is even, you know, in Moroccan traditional culture, uh, much more shameful um, in order for them to recant um, or desist from publishing um, critical articles um, of the monarchy. Um, so here you can see here um, these, uh, these civil society organizations that um, took up Hezer's case and said, we demand the immediate release of Hezer Rasuni. Uh, women should have the right to decide what to do with their own body. Um, and you have here this little um, cartoon graphic, um, which is kind of making a little bit of a mockery of the king. Um, and that is an absolute no-no um, in um, Moroccan society. Um, the other thing that she reported on um, was this Hirak movement, right? Um, this also occurred in the region of the Reef in Morocco, and um, these were protests that took place between October 2016 and June 2017. And the images in the back are people, um, you know, the, the extent um, and size of the protests. Um, these demonstrations occurred against the death of Mohsin Fikri, um, who was a fishmonger and he was crushed to death after jumping into the back of a, gar of a garbage truck following the confiscation by local authorities of the fish, which he was selling on the local market. Um, and it's a kind of a similar situation to the, um, 
um, the case of Mohamed Bouazizi in Tunisia, um, who set himself on fire um, after the police confiscated his wares um, in, and set off um, what we call the Arab Spring. Um, here, um, Mohsin was accused of selling fish out of, out of season. Um, but the issue here was also um, how to make a living in the formal economy and the lack of opportunities of um, people in the current system of making, um, of making a decent living. So she was writing, Hajar uh, Rasuni, the journalist, um, was covering that Hirak movement and was writing against corruption and um, the demand for jobs and dignity, right? Um, and for that, uh, at least the, uh, her lawyers and um, the advocates in Amnesty International um, believe that she was targeted with these false accusations of, um, of premarital sex and abortion. Um, again, using her body and the, uh, the transgressions um, as dictated by the law, um, the, the law that is, that is deemed to be permanent, but yet has been revised twice in this family code um, as proof. Um, and this also gets me to this, um, to my last slide, which is, you know, how we can look at um, the, the struggle for gender equality, right? Gender equality as a lifespan a struggle that is itself global, right? Um, and um, this is from the UN, um, and it is a vision of, you know, through the life cycle, particularly of women, um, and what the different um, freedoms are um, as, as we move through the different um, stages in the life cycle. For, so, for example, um, the freedom to move without the permission of a guardian, right? Um, so going places examines the constraints on freedom of movement, um, the, uh, the freedom to start a job, um, and this analyzes um, laws affecting women's decisions to work, um, the, uh, the right to be paid, um, and it measures laws and regulations affecting women's pay and equal pay for equal work. Um, we are ourselves um, engaged in that particular struggle, and um, consent of getting married so that um, um, e that women can uh, no longer depend on uh, or be submitted subject to uh, arranged marriages or uh, pressure by the family um, to um, to submit um, to uh, different you know marriage arrangements the idea of um, having children um, the laws of women of women's work after having children, um, and then um, running a business um, and economic independence, um, and managing assets. Um, now, these uh, these legal codes um, give women really a, a lot of independence in terms of managing assets, um, and especially in the dowry. And then, in in the end. Um, having the opportunity um, to get a pension, right? Um, and I think uh, if we go back to Lila's um, images, um, these women that are pictured in these stereotypical um, roles and, and, and poses um, that are subject, um, that have them being um, objects, but actually she transforms through the gaze through the reminder of the henna, um, of the of the writing across the body, and the stare, the 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 firm gaze of women looking back um, through their in whatever condition they are, and the transformation of what would be um, uh, objects or symbols of oppression, like uh, the writing on the body or the bullets, into art. And I think she offers us a vision of liberation um, here. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia. That was wonderfully thought-provoking in conjunction with uh, the exhibition. 
which I don't think I mentioned in my introduction, but if you would like to see a virtual tour of the exhibition or browse uh, the artwork, some of which Sylvia evocatively did a little mashup in our opening slide, you can visit our website, fairfield.edu slash museum slash Lala Asadi. Uh, and I just wanted to remark on a couple of things um, and we invite people to share any questions or comments they may have in the chat. But I want to go back to something you'd said at the outset of your talk, and you mentioned the importance of not reproducing Orientalist structures when we are looking at um, North Africa, for example, and not assuming that we are in a more quote unquote advanced um, state of development. And I was wondering whether how you as a scholar and also as a teacher, how do you um, do that work yourself when you're working and how do you teach undergraduate students to pursue that same mindset? Well, I think it's a, it's a constant reminder. Um, and it, for me, it's a um, it's presenting students, for example, with those with those images that repro that do reproduce um, those stereotypes and then deconstructing them bit by bit in class and then giving enough examples to kind of compare and also um, uh, to remind them of the ways in which we face similar struggles um, in our in our daily situations, right? So it's so it's always kind of um, doing this double jump uh, back and forth, uh, uh, this double interrogation, right? And that's another thing that that sort of related. I get well. I guess this is turning it over to the artist side of things. So you had pointed out a way in which we, as Westerners, have to really remind ourselves of our, our position, and then you also highlighted a way in which I had not thought about Lala Asadi's position, as she creates these wonderfully evocative photographs in which she's you know challenging these ideas of Moroccan womanhood, but as you pointed out, it's a very specific and elite, wealthy upper class Moroccan womanhood that she is featuring. They are not women from those um, shanty towns in Reef that you were showing. And when you mentioned um, the idea of a polygamy having been legal, but that many men did not pursue it because they didn't have the resources to keep multiple wives equally, it reminded me I had uh, watched an interview with Lala, it was on YouTube, and the interviewer who was introducing her mentioned that she had grown up in a family in Morocco and that her father did have four wives. So now realizing that is like that was a sign of, of wealth that she must have come from and privilege for her to be able to, you know, to make these extraordinary, um, extraordinary photographs. So thank you for sort of shining that light on, um, you know, an aspect of the artist's own position. You know, she wants to present Morocco to the world. And of course, she is presenting a particular kind of view onto their society. Yeah. And her interior spaces are, are palaces, right? They're very overwhelming. I mean, they're, they they exist and they're part of the society, but not. But but the majority of the population doesn't live that way, right? Um, and has no access to that, right? Um, and and faces. I mean, obviously, I think she's also. Um, um, I think she might be pursuing this this part of beauty, right? Um, of this, uh, you know, to try. Uh, I mean there's there's hardly any beauty in poverty right um, so how do you highlight that right um but but definitely is the i mean it's there um that 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 the class aspect is 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 definitely either middle or upper class mm -hmm. yeah and since you mentioned you mentioned beauty um both of the two cases of the two the journalists and uh, amina that you um that you mentioned like both of them were clearly so lovely and it was just shocking to me when you had Amina's life dates on screen that it didn't make sense to me for a moment. She could only have been 16. Like I was trying to sort of do the math in my mind. I was like, well, what are those dates? Is that the dates the case was active? And then I realized when you said she was 16, that that was the entire span of okay. her life. But then I was also reminding myself, you know, as you were talking, just going back to the, you know, resisting the call to reproduce those structures that it's not that child marriage does not happen in this country or other abuses of women and children. It's not that they don't happen here. Um, we just happen to be discussing this particular case um, in Morocco. Um, someone just asked if we could repeat the, the website link for our audience uh, to visit this wonderful exhibition. That's fairfield.edu slash museum slash Lala Ifadi. And that is L-A-L-L-A-E-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-S-
So we hope that you will take a look at the exhibition through our virtual tour. You can listen to an audio guide. You can also catch up on um, some of the other programs that we've had related to the exhibition, including a talk by um, the curator, Cynthia, Cynthia Becker. And if anyone is watching this not live, watching this in reproduction, and has any questions that you would like to share with Dr. Marcin Sackley, please feel free to send them to the museum. And if she is able to answer them, we would be more than happy to offer you that. Um, but in conclusion, just want to thank you again, Sylvia, for that wonderful lecture. And thank everyone who has been watching. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. <laughs>